All right, let's get started with this first video in a series of eight videos with corresponding exercises in this course called Introduction to Data Analysis with R, specifically um, done for the biochemist at Heidelberg University. But um, if you are not from Heidelberg University, you can just join throughout your scientific career and potentially outside of it, you will encounter various forms of data. Maybe you do an experiment and measure the fluorescence of a molecular probe, or you simply count the penguins at your local zoo. Everything is data in some form or another. But raw numbers without context are meaningless. And tables of numbers are boring to look at. And they often not hide the actual structure behind the data. So in this course, you will learn to create pretty and insightful visualizations compute different statistics on your data, and also what those statistical concepts mean. From penguins to p-values, I got you covered. Um, speaking of I, um, I am Yannick Boer. I'm a biochemist just like you, but lately I've actually been doing mostly bioinformatics. If you want to find out more about me, you can find all the information on my website, or just send me um, an email via my contact form. You can also find me on Twitter, GitHub, LinkedIn, all that stuff. This course will be held in English, but you can ask questions in German as well. Pretty much any language I understand is fine. My Latin is a little rusty though. And what we'll be doing is using R to analyze data. So what is this R? This is the logo. R is a programming language invented by statisticians. And this makes it um, really interactive. It's a really nice language for data analysis, but it's still a programming language, so don't worry if this is your first encounter with programming. We will take one step at a time. Um, furthermore, the data sets I chose are not particular to biology or molecular biology. Rather, I chose some more general data sets that require less introduction, so we can focus on the tools and learning R and statistics. So this is why we will be talking about penguins, racing games, life expectancies, instead of intricate molecular measurements. So let's get into it. First things first, you will need to download R. You can do this from this website here, and you will need to download RStudio. You might be confused as to what the difference is. Um, RStudio is what you call an integrated development environment, so R is the programming language, and RStudio gives you a nice um, sort of dashboard around it to make it easier to use and nicer to use. So without further ado, let's actually just jump right into RStudio. Let me close this presentation and open up a fresh instance of RStudio. All right, this is what our studio looks like when you first open it up. Although in your case, the console that you're seeing here is probably on the left side. I just moved it there so we can have more space for the code that we will be writing. So in this console, we can already execute some R commands. We can, for example, add one to one. And R tells us the answer is two, which is a good proof that something is at least working. We can also do some more R specific thing, like you type one colon 10 to generate the numbers from one to 10. But I won't be typing directly in the console for, for much because I care a lot about reproducibility. So that means when you are finished with your analysis and you come back maybe a week later, maybe a year later, you want to just click one button, it runs again, and you know what you did. So what we want to do instead of typing in the console and forgetting everything after after we did, we write it in a, in a script here, and then we send it to the console, execute it, and then we keep that script. This script is really important. Like if you keep this script, even if all else fails, if you lose your output, that's fine. If you have the script, you can regenerate your output. So what you want to do is Click this little plus button here, new script. I already had an un untitled script open, so I only need one. Um, and in here we can type, for example, let's 
use one plus one again. And now to execute, we press Control Enter. So Control Enter takes a line and sends it to the console to execute it. If you take 43 minus one, we can also highlight things and send them to the console using Control Enter. If nothing is highlighted, it's just the whole line. Let's discover our first R function. It's called paste. And the RStudio auto completion already helps us. So we can just hit enter to accept that. And now in quotation marks, I write some text like hello, and then a comma, it's another, and in, in, in more quotation marks, let's say world, and an exclamation mark because we're really excited. And now I send this to the console using control enter. And now paste takes multiple arguments and adds them together. Just like plus does for numbers, paste is for text. And text you can re recognize by these quotation marks. Another important thing is comments. Comments start with this hashtag symbol, the number symbol. And comments are ignored by R. So if I write hashtag anything and I execute this, nothing happens. If I execute this whole script using this source button, it runs the whole script, but this comment is, just doesn't do anything. So you can use this to take notes of your thoughts during data analysis. So you have already seen numbers and text, but let's get more into the atomic data types that R provides. So these are basically the building blocks of R. We have numbers like say 12 or 12.5. Or 12 oh, that's not 12, 12.5. So numbers can be whole numbers and any number of decimal places, um, but not, not all of them might be printed due to an option you can set. And then there are numbers which are like explicitly whole numbers. We don't den denote those by appending this L. So this one is now actually, it's a whole one. It's not one point something. This is different to 1.0. So this is what we call these numbers, we just call numeric, and these ones we call integer numbers. These numerics are sometimes also called double or float because they have can have floating points numbers. There are also complex numbers in R, but they are rarely used. But you can create complex numbers, say 1 plus 3i for the imaginary part. It's totally doable, not often used. And then um, there is text, which is again denoted by these quotation marks. Uh, you can also use single quotation marks, by the way. Um, let's uh, write some text in here. It's night again, for example this also. So this text um, also is also called character or strings. Furthermore, there are logical values or sometimes called a boolean, which can be either true or false. And then there are some special types which is null, which is essentially no result. And then there's NA for not assigned. <coughs> which means we didn't know the answer. This has also some um, implications on other operations. This NA is contagious. So say we want to add 
1 to an a the answer will always be an a because if you add 1 to something which you don't know you also don't know the answer or the maximum using the max function of an a and 12 and 1 and 0 is an a because well we don't know the answer it could be anything we can ask for the type of any object in R using the type of function. Say type of hello is character. There's also a concept called factors, um, but we will get um, into those later when we actually need them. So quite often you will want to store the result of a computation to reuse later, or to simply give it a sensible name and make your code more readable. This is what variables are for. We can create them by assigning something to, to them. And for this, we need the assignment operator, which is less than and a minus sign. This is the assignment operator. We can quickly insert one using our studio's shortcut alt minus. So let's assign something to a vari variable called my number and call it 42. <clears throat> and now whenever we use my number, we get 42. So we can use this in any cont context that we would normally use 42. So we can do operations with it. We can say, what's my number plus um, 54 and we get the result. We can also say create some more variables like x, let's call it 41, and y, let's assign one to it, and then we can add x and y. Now, if I execute this line now, notice the, we get an error, object x not found. This is because I didn't execute these lines first. So let me execute those, and now it works. In this case, it makes sense because this is the natural order of execution from top to bottom. In a script, you, you could generally just jump around and execute things in whatever order you want. But keep in mind, if we run this whole script using the source button, it will run from top to bottom. So we want to make sure we follow a logical sequence. Also, um, say we have um, x1 in this case, and then we say y is x plus 1. And now we run this, right? Now one is two, uh, y is two, that's good. If I now assign 1000 to x, and now we look at, I look at y, y is still two. So even if the dependencies of some expression change later on, this expression doesn't change unless we were to execute this again now. So now if I run this, I get 1001. Let's talk a little bit about how you can name your variables. So there's one convention called snake case because variable names cannot have spaces. So in order to, instead of a space, you just use an underscore. Um, so we call it say main character name close okay sometimes people also use camel case where you just capitalize whenever you sort of change a word like book title so the name of the wind and now we can use those variables. Variable names can also have numbers in them. For example, we can have x1 being 12, but they cannot have numbers in the first, as the first um, character. All right, now we're getting to sort of my favorite topic, um, functions. In general, in R, everything that exists is an object, Everything that does something is a function. 
And functions are the main workhorse, workhorse of our data analysis. For example, there are mathematical functions like uh, the sine, and we can get the sine of x equals 1 or 0, and this is 0 as well, or 1 is 0 0.8 something. I think there's also pi already in there, yeah. But due to some rounding, this is not actually 0, it's only as close to 0 as the computer gets. So what functions do is they take arguments, sometimes also called parameters, um, and in this case the argument is x. And then they return something. And what we do with this returned value is up to us. In this case, if we don't do anything with it, we just execute it, R just prints it to the console. But we can also assign it to a variable. Let's call it result. And now it didn't print anything except um, that it ran this line. And now we can use result to get the result. There's one, <coughs> one little gotcha maybe. Um, these parameters can have the same names as variables you have defined outside. For example, this parameter is called x and we already have a variable called x. But even though we sort of temporarily assign pi to x inside this function, it doesn't affect our x outside. So this x out here is still, what is it, should be 1000. Yeah, it's still 1000. So it didn't magically turn into pi. Um, this is only everything inside of these hmm, inside of these brackets is only for the context of the function. So if you have say an x defined outside of it, 10, and say cosine of x equals 1, now x is still 10. Only for the context of this function exec execution it was we had an x that had the value 1. One of the actually most important functions in R is the question mark. If you have write question mark and then the name of a function, it opens up the help page, which is, as the name suggests, incredibly helpful. Um, they always have a description, which is often fairly detailed, and then it tells us what arguments it gets. All those functions only get one argument called x, and then there's a and 2 which actually gets y and x, so two arguments. And there's some more details, and it tells us the value it returns. And down here there's always some examples of how to use them, which is really handy. In general, we can pass arguments to functions either by by their name, so we know that the sine function takes one argument, x, but we can also pass it just by order of appearance. So we know the first argument, and actually the only argument, is x, so we can just write sine of 12, and we get the same result. Let's talk about vectors. So in general, a vector is an ordered collection of things which have the same data type. So a data type is something like numbers, numeric, text, so character or string, um, whole numbers, integers. And the basic data types in R are all vectors by default, which means they can actually contain more than one entry. We can create a vector ourselves using the function C for combine. So C and then we pass arguments to the function C in these um, brackets. So 1 maybe, and 2, and 3, and 4, and 5. If I execute this, I get a vector with the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And I can assign this um, again to x. That's, I guess, fine. It's not like real analysis code. In general, you would want better names for your variables and not use the same name over and over again. But now x is numbers from 1 to 5. We can also have vectors of words. So yeah, this is a word, this is a word as well. 
more text. So this is what we will call a character vector. Um, we can also generate vector of boolean values. True, false, if I can type. Let's say true again. What we can't have is a, vect a vector where the data types are different. So if we try to create a vector with like one and two and three, we have two numbers and text. What R does is it forces the data types to be the data type that allows the most things. And because all numbers can be converted into text, but not the other way around, it just converts the number one into the text that contains a one. And with these texts, we just can't, we can't compute anymore. Right? This is the text one, not the number one. So if I try to add an actual one to it, it doesn't work. R tells us error non-numeric argument to binary operator or a binary operator is this plus. It's an operator that takes two arguments. And the first thing is non-numeric, so R doesn't want to do it. If you see these error messages, it's totally normal. And um, well, you see those all the time as a programmer. Um, and it's it's actually just a, a helpful way to communicate with R telling us what's working and what's not working. So we can convert this text actually back to a number explicitly using s.numeric. So this will convert it back to numbers. Now we can actually calculate with it. And as you have seen in the autocomplete, there's a number of other um, conversion functions. You could also convert it to a character which is what R did automatically up here. Now, when we have a collection of things like X, for example, you might wonder how we get specific elements of this vector. And this is called subsetting. Let's actually create another vector, um, call it my elements. And the first we just call first, the second element we call second, and the third element we conveniently call third. So this is what our vector looks like. We can get the second element using square brackets. So this is not the round ones for function call, subsetting uses square brackets. Um, and in here we can tell R, okay, we want the second element. R actually starts counting from one. So one is actually the first element as opposed to other programming languages which, st which start from zero, but R doesn't do that. That's empty. R starts from one, so the third element is actually the third element. We can also use this to not only access elements, but you can also change them. If I assign this to the third element, say a new thing, and now I look at my elements, now we have first, second, and a new thing. Vectors can also have names, which is convenient because then we don't need to reference them by their position. We can also reference them by their names. So we use the function names of my elements. And if we execute this, well, <coughs> R tells us there's no names here. But we can assign to this function call, actually. So we assign some names. First name second, let's call it thing, and third. Now if I look at my elements, we have the names printed up here. We can still use the numbers to get specific elements, but now we can also use these names, second thing, for example. <coughs> if we want to get multiple things, we simply pass a vector of, well, either indices, say we want the first and the third element. Now we get the first and the third, or we could also pass a vector of names. Another way to get elements is to pass a vector of booleans, so true, false, and the likes. Let's say 
true, we, we want the first element, but false for the second and maybe also false for the third element. So now we only get the first element. If I change this to true, we get the first and third. These vectors have another important implication and this is vectorization. So the basic mathematical operations that are are all vectorized by default. And vectorized means they can operate on individual elements of a vector. Vectorization. So let's take um, again a vector x. I'm sorry about those names, but um, let's make it 1, 2, 3, and 42, and 5, and 2 again, maybe. All right. If I now look at x, we got these get these numbers. I can multiply, for example, this vector by two, and now what we get is double each element. Same if we add one, or add let's add one hundred to it. We add one hundred to every element. However, this does not change the original x, so x is still the same. If we want to change x, we need to assign back 2x. And now x changed. There is a really handy way of, of creating um, these sequences of numbers using the colon operator I've shown in the very beginning. Um, so let's say 1 to 10 are the numbers from 1 to 10. If we want to get a bit more specific, we can use the sec function for sequence. Oh, if I either type question mark sec, we get the help. I can also um, press F1 over the function. F1 sends you straight to the help page. It's really, really handy. It's maybe my most used key. Now, if I trigger autocomplete in here using tab or control spacebar, well, it just tells us to get arguments from other from other methods. So let's actually look in here. Ah, it takes the arguments from and to and by and maybe length out or long width. So let's use from one to let's say ten but only by two. And now we get all uneven numbers. So we just learned about the sign and the sec and the max function, but there's more. Not only in the sense that there are more functions in R, I mean, what kind of language would that be with only a couple of verbs, but also in a more powerful way because we can define our own functions. So this enables us to take maybe a complicated sequence of steps that we need in a later part of the analysis again and again, just write it into a function and then we can use it again and again, just like we use these built-in functions. So let's define a function. Um, it goes like this. We write a name for the function and then the assignment operator and the function keyword, which is basically like a function. But in here now we need to say which parameters we are giving to the function. Um, parameter 1, for example, and parameter 2. And then after we close the parentheses, we start with curly brackets or curly braces. So this and closes the body of a function. It's like the name for a function and our function head in a way. And then you have the body of a function which actually does the computations. For example, um, let's create a result and assign parameter one plus parameter, parameter two to it. And then we return, return the result. Now I executed this by just putting my cursor on this line 
pressing Control Enter. And now I can use a name for the function, like we did used earlier functions. Say I give it 1 and 1 and 41, and we get 42. That's good. Now there's a couple of things we can improve about this function. Firstly, it doesn't have a very nice name. So let's um, create this function again, but this time we give it another name. Actually, this function is called add because it adds two numbers. And it's a function of, let's call these parameters for sake of brevity, x and y. And what it does is it adds x and y. And that's it <clears throat> because by default, if we don't use return inside a function, R will simply return the last expression. And you will often see people omitting this explicit return in favor of this implicit return. So this function works just as well. So we just wrote our first little function, which is not very useful because, well, there's already a function that adds two numbers. But you are not the only one using R. There's a whole community of people out there writing functions. And if you write about a bunch of functions that make a specific task easier, what people do is they put it into a package. So a package is basically a collection of functions. And then some people even went a step further and they created a bunch of packages which work very well together. And this is called the tidyverse. So the tidyverse is a collection of packages which make our data analysis task way easier and more straightforward. They also iron out some of the wrinkles in our R's default functions and make it more consistent so it's way easier to learn and use. So how do we get these packages? For this, we need the function install.packages and then we give it the name of a package, like tidyverse. And now it will search for the package online and download it and install it. You can also use um, our Studio's package panel here, which will do pretty much the same thing. If you're doing this for the first time, it might take a while longer, but you can also search for packages here. Notice that I didn't write the install packages function in our script because, well, if this is an actual script, for our data analysis, we don't want to install the package every time we run the analysis. This is one exception to writing everything in the script. This is what I just run in the console <clears throat> because you only need to install a package once and then, and then maybe sometimes update it. Now, how do we actually use the functions from this package? Um, we use the function library so library loads a package. And what we want to load is the tidyverse. So I run this. We get a little startup message from the tidyverse. Um, I think I maybe I turned, I turned off the startup message, but you will, you will get a message. And now we can use the functions from the tidyverse. Before we actually do that, there's another package I would like to introduce. And I would actually like you to use this in the course. It is called R Markdown. Install packages, R Markdown. Now I'm not actually running this because, well, I already have it installed. So R Markdown enables us to take, take some, some text, our code for data analysis, and then we can combine this into a report which can have basically any output format. We can create Word documents from it, we can create PDFs, we can, um, we can create websites. Actually, this whole course website that you're maybe watching this video on was created using R Markdown. Um, 
as well as all the scripts. So it's actually quite magical, um, just really cool things. And it's especially helpful for data analysis because we can document our thoughts that we have doing data analysis alongside our code. And we have this one package which contains everything you need in order to understand the analysis. After having installed our markdown, what we want to do is go up here to the little plus file button and create a new markdown document. We can give it a title, amazing example, and we can already choose the output format, but uh, don't sweat over that decision. We can just change it later on. We can also create presentations and other cool things. Um, but for now, let's create an HTML document. I like HTML because you don't have to worry about page breaks. So this is what we get. We get this little template. And now let's talk about what we're seeing here. Um, first things first is what's called metadata in a format called YAML. Um, it starts with three minus signs and ends with three minus signs. And we have these parameters, which have some, um, some values. Title, we have the author and the date and the output format. And there's a bunch more um, parameters that uh, you can set. For example, like a theme for the HTML document, um, but we're not getting into that right now. Now next, um, let's actually skip to this part. We have a uh, text. So this is just regular text and uses a formatting called Markdown. Um, you can learn more about the Markdown formatting on the cheat sheet that I linked also in, in the script. Um, but in general, it just means it's text and you can use some formatting things like making things bold using these double stars or italics using these underscores. And the next essential part is code chunks. And they start with these three backticks. Now where those are depends on your keyboard. I hope you'll find them. And then in curly braces, some more information about this code chunk. So first, the language this code chunk is in. So we could have other language engines like Python, for example, but we will be only using R. Um, and then a name for the chunk. This one is called setup and setup is actually a bit special. So um, setup will be included by default. And there's some um, general options for all chunks. Echo means it will show our code in the final output. And here um, we have another one titled cars. The titles for the chunks are optional, but they are quite helpful. And it runs the fun summary function on the cars dataset. So what we can do inside of code chunks, we can actually write code in here just like we would in a script. And I can execute this using control enter. But now you get the output underneath the chunk. And I can also execute the whole chunk using this little play button up here. And this ran the whole code and we get the summary result for the cars dataset. Cars actually is a dataset included in R, which is some information about some cars. Um, I don't actually know um, where it comes from. In order to run a whole chunk, we can, well, either use the button, but we can also use the shortcut Control Shift Enter. And um, I like shortcuts, they make your life way easier and faster. Now, if you are done with your analysis, so you wrote down your thoughts during the analysis, you gave them some, some, he some headings, some nice formatting maybe, um, and you have your code in here, you can knit this whole document. So you combine everything into one document. Oh, first I need to save it. Now we can actually knit it. So what it did is it ran the, the R code in this document. It took the text and combined everything. So this is what code and the results all combined in one document. We can also just open it in, in a browser. Ah, here. This is our little HTML document. If you have something like LaTeX installed, 
You can also create, for example, a PDF document. I can use, um, well, I, I don't, often don't use the knit button. I just press Control Shift K for knit and it does the same thing. And now we get a beautiful PDF um, if, you, if you're into PDFs. Let's actually switch back to HTML. Actually, if we look into our markdown HTML document, open up the help page for this, um, we can see more options that we could potentially put into this YAML header here. For example, let me introduce you to the theme function and the theme parameter. So instead of writing an HTML document, we put it on a new line, indented. YAML is quite specific about indentation and then again on a new line indented theme for Letly, save and knit again and now um, we get actually a different a different look. The size of these code chunks is not limited you can write really really large or really really small chunks um, but try to keep them in like a sensible structure and order. So we actually don't need this example text here. What we want to do is explore our first data set and I'm making this a heading. And well I have you in installing a bunch of packages today but um, the data set we will be using is actually in a package so Data packages can not only contain um, functions, they can also contain some more data sets to, to work with. And what you will want to do is install dot packages palmer penguins. Let me insert a new code chunk. Oh, I, I didn't tell you yet how to insert a new code chunk. Um, you can either use the little plus button up here to insert a new R chunk, for example. But what I do is control alt i. It's uh, the shortcut is all, uh, also in the script. Control Alt I. So let's um, load our packages. Um, Power penguins, um, and I will also be loading the tidyverse because we will use it later. And now I execute this chunk to load it. Didn't actually change much, but we now have the penguins data set. Let's run this. So here we have some data from the Palmer up archipelago in Antarctica about um, three islands where we have three different penguin species and they collected the bill lengths, um, the bill depths, um, the flipper lengths, body mass, sex, and year at which it was recorded. It's actually a bunch of interesting information. We can learn more about the structure of an object or dataset using the function str for structure. So it tells us species is a factor. Um, we'll get later into what factors do. Um, Island is a factor, billings is numeric, spill depth, flip, flipper lengths, integers, body mass, only whole numbers. So before we get deeper into this actual data set, let's talk about the format that our data is in. Um, this is what we call a data frame, or in the tidyverse it's called a tibble, which sounds a bit like table, so it's a tibble. Um, and these are actually built on top of a data structure called lists. So I want to actually talk about lists first before we get into data frames, and then we talk about the penguins. So let's create a list using the function list and in list we can actually have different data types. What we couldn't do with atomic vectors we can now do with lists. For example this list has a one, it has some text, it even has another vector inside of it and lists can also contain other lists. Let's look at my list. 
Now R gives us these square brackets. Previously we only saw these single brackets and this already gives us a hint at how we can subset, so take individual pieces of lists. If we use double square brackets, we get individual elements of the list. For example, the third element is this vector. There's a bit of a, a gotcha here, because if we use um, single brackets, we get something as well, but um, notice there's still this double bracket one in here. So single brackets on a list actually give us another list back. So what we get here, if we use single brackets and then one element is a list with one element, and this one element is the vector. However, if we use double square brackets, we actually get the element. This is something you might want to be aware, aware of. Lists can also have names, and we can also create those names right during creation of the list. So let's create a new list, which we conveniently call new list. And I think I want to create a new line here. R actually doesn't care about new lines and empty space, um, which is why we can have this nice formatting here. So let's say x is the numbers from 1 to 3, um, y is some random other numbers, and let's call our third element third and put some text in here. Let's look at this new list. Okay, now we see these dollars. And this already tells us, okay, we can now use dollars to subset our list. Um, if I type new list and then dollar, auto completion kicks in and we can select one element of the list. So this is the same as using double square brackets. Dollars are the same. We can also use the old um, way of selecting things by name, um, but the dollar is more convenient because it gives us the auto completion. There's one more thing I did. Notice that I put vectors into this list, but I made sure that all vectors have the same lengths. This is not in general a requirement for lists. But what I want to do now is use the function as data frame on this new list. Oops. So a data frame is basically a more restricted list in which all elements must be vectors of the same length. They can also be lists of the same length, but they must be the same length. Let's call it our first df, okay, for data frame. And it also prints quite nicely. There's um, one difference between this data frame, if we just print it in the console, it looks like this, um, and, and the penguins data set. It prints nicer. We have this information about the columns and the size of our data frame. This is because it is a table, and the table is it still works like a data frame, but it has some more um, methods for making it plot nicer in the console. So instead of as data frame, we could also write um, as table. Actually, R tells us the new name for this is as underscore table. This is because dots and function names um, are a bit outdated. Um, they are still in a lot of old R functions and they are, they are not going away, um, but they can be confusing. So try not to use dots in your function variable names. So this is why the tidyverse uses underscores instead. All right, let's get into some visualizations. We have these 
three lovely penguin species, Chinstrap, Gentoo and Adelaide. And we have a bunch of information about them in our penguins dataset. So what we want to do now is use one package from the tidyverse. Like I said, the tidyverse is a collection of packages. So one of those packages is called ggplot2. Well, ggplot2 because the first ggplot, he, he had some better ideas after afterwards. So he, he made ggplot2. Um, and ggplot2 um, stands for grammar of graphics plot. And this grammar of graphics was invented by someone called Leland Wilkinson. Um, link is also in the script. And then Hadley Wickham came along and modified this a bit and turned it into an R package. So we can actually use this graphic, uh, this grammar, to not only talk about visualizations the same way we talk about language, but also to build up um, visualizations from these individual layers. So we got these geoms, which are geometric objects, which make up our ggplot. We have some themes we can apply. We have um, aesthetics, which map how features of our data map to geometric objects. Before we look at the code that I used to create this plot, let's actually talk about what we need in order to create this plot and thus sort of discover this grammar of graphics ourselves. So firstly, we have this general plot area and on there we have these features of our data. So every data point belongs to one of those three species and has a sex. It also has a flipper length and a bill length. So every data point corresponds to one penguin. And then there's some way of mapping these features to aesthetic properties of the plot. For example, the flipper length is mapped to the x-axis and the species is mapped to the color. This is what we call an aesthetic mapping. Then we have the title and all that. But now we also need some geometric objects to represent those aesthetics. And for this, we have points and triangles. So you could call those both of those points, but the shape is actually mapped to the sex. Let's create this plot step by step. We call the function ggplot from the ggplot2 package. We don't need to load it because we already loaded the whole tidyverse, which includes ggplot. And the first argument to it is the data. So let's put the penguins in there. And now we get, oh, an empty plot. That's something. Now the next thing we'll want to do is add this aesthetic mapping that I talked about. Um, we can either do this in here, mapping, or we can add it straight away. So all the layers in ggplot are combined together using the add, the little plus symbol. And I usually do this on a new line. To add aesthetic mappings, we use the function AES. So we add this to the plot. What we want on the x-axis is the flipper. Let me put this up here so I can, can see what, what we are talking with, talking about. We want the flipper length in millimeter. On the y-axis, I think we want the bill, bill length. I just copy and paste these. And as the color, we want to use the species information. And for the shape, we want to use sex information for the penguins. Now, our plot now has the correct dimensions and some scaling, but there's no geometric objects to represent our mapping. So what I want to do is add some points. All the geometric objects start with geom underscore and we want geom point. Now if I run this, ta-da, we get some points and they have the correct shape. Notice that these colors are actually different than the first plot. This is because how you map an aesthetic like color to a feature is governed by scales. And this is just the default color scale. So scales can vary the 
x-axis scale, they can also vary colors and shapes and all that. So what we want to do is scale underscore, and now we get all the scale functions through order complete. complete. So what we want to do is scale color, um, and I'm actually just using, um, let me use the color brewer package. Scale color brewer, which just has some, has some nice color palettes. So we want a qualitative color palette. If you want to know more about how this works, you can look at the help function for scale color brewer. Now we get different colors. And something else was different about this plot, which is like the overall theme, how the plot looks. And it also had a title and a subtitle. So titles and labels and all that are changed using the labs function. So the X labels for X, for example, we want flipper lengths and then we want millimeter in the square brackets for y. We want the bill length and millimeter in square brackets, which just looks nicer than using these underscores. Um, and then title, title is gonna be amazing penguin plot. Exclamation mark, of course. You can already guess that the subtitle would just be subtitle. And then we add some theming to it. We can do everything inside of this theme, theme function. We just specify a bunch of things. Um, but first, let's start with some preset like theme light, for example. Well, actually, what I used up here is theme minimal. And then if we want to specify more individual things, we can go into the theme function. Um, and then for example, the legend dot text, we want to change. And all these parameters inside of the theme function, they take a specification for how these elements should look like, these elements the theme is specifying. And these function, uh, these specifications are generated using the element function. So element underscore text. And now we get more information about how we can change text. So let's actually make the font face bold. And this changes the legend text in here to be a bold font. Before moving on to the exercises, let's actually talk a little bit about um, how you can find help if you get stuck or how you can learn more about our and our studio as well. And to do that, let me pull down, yes, the little script. Um, this is the script you will also see on the website. So um, you will find all the links here. Um, there's a brilliant book called R for Data Science, um, which you can read online for free, which by the way, is also written in our markdown. Um, by uh, Gary Trollmott and Hadley Wickham. Um, Hadley Wickham is the, the guy who sort of started this whole tidyverse thing with ggplot and then um, later what we will learn um, next week, which is dplyr. Um, then we have the R for Data Science online learning community, which I'm also a part of. I'm uh, there every Monday evening answering questions. Um, so we have a bunch of learners and a bunch of mentors. It's a Slack channel basically where you can ask questions, especially when you're working through this book called R for Data Science. Um, what I find really handy is the RStudio cheat sheets. For example, here's the one for ggplot. And you can use this to just get a quick overview or refresh your knowledge of some topics. Um, there's also the modern dive, which is a bit like R for Data Science um, with more focus on statistics. Um, the R Studio Education website um, provides some nice resources for learners. Um, and for a Markdown specifically, there's the cheat sheet, um, there's the R Markdown cookbook, and the R Markdown book, um, and uh, some more advanced stuff like Pandoc, which actually is the 
part that created the different output formats. Um, if you want to get deeper into how our works behind the scenes, because in this course we will be using mostly the tidyverse and not look too much into how uh, how and why our works the way it does, um, you can look into advanced R or hands-on programming. <clears throat> if you want to create your own packages, um, it's a nice way to just look up our packages, um, the R packages book. And um, there's a bunch of more resources here. For statistics, which we didn't do any today, but we will will do. Um, one book I really like is Intuitive Biostatistics by Harvey Motulski. And there's another um, a resource which is um, free, which is Statistics Done Wrong by uh, Alex Reinhardt, which I really, really like. Um, and this is also quite a light read, so you can, you can basically just um, read it for fun. It's also really, really well written. Um, <clears throat> there's also some talks and podcasts uh, that I list here, uh, and all these um, visual, um, all these illustrations that I use in the course that are so cute um, are done by Alison Horst, and you you can use her artwork if you credit her. Um, all her her artwork is on GitHub, and she also has some really really good explanations in these artworks for a concept. Maybe tidy data. We will we we'll talk about tidy data next week, for example. Um, and there's some more advanced stuff like Git. All right, so you're not alone. The community is there to catch you, and you can also always ask questions in the Discord channel. Now, <clears throat> um, I won't go over the exercises now. You can look them up in the script. But I want to go over um, how we will do this whole exercise thing. Because um, this course is not created. Um, but um, I need some way of confirming that you did indeed take part in this course. So what I actually ask of you is to solve a minimum of five out of the eight exercises. Um, so these will be released with the video on Mondays. And then I would like to see them in my, my inbox or maybe in the Discord channel if you want um, by Friday. Because on Friday we will actually talk about those exercises and we'll do office hours um, using a big, big blue button on the high conf system. Um, and these exercises are designed in a way that you use our markdown because this, this way you can also include your thoughts. So if you get stuck, you can just write down why you got stuck or um, where you got stuck, what you tried or, or already. So it's fine if you can't solve all the um, questions as long as you write down why you got stuck and how I can better answer your questions. So, um, yeah, um, I will finish the video here. Now, um, please go ahead and try yourself on the exercises um, or we watch parts of the video, have a look at the script, um, whatever you need to, to get started with this R. All right.